From Exchange to DA, Etienne Stallmans. En la mayoría de las organizaciones, Microsoft Exchange es la puerta hacia el mundo. Por lo tanto, suele estar de cara a Internet y con medidas de seguridad especial. En esta charla, veremos cómo a pesar de todas las medidas e incluso cuando las organizaciones migran a un entorno cloud, se sigue teniendo acceso a los entornos internos y es allí donde a través de tráfico legítimo lograron ejecutar código remoto con VBScript. Se discutirá cómo se encontró este vector de ataque y cómo fue explotado. Etienne Stallmans es analista de seguridad senior e investigador en Saints Post, con un interés especial en reverseo de protocolos y la búsqueda de formas de abusar de funcionalidades en productos de todos los días. Uh, buenos días, soy Etienne y soy un senior security researcher de SensePost en Londres, pero uh, estoy viviendo en Madrid desde agosto. Uh, ¿Quieres hablar conmigo en español? Uh, espera un montón a uh, repetir, por favor. Pero yo necesito de uh, la práctica. Okay, I'm not going to do the talk in Spanish because we'll be here until tomorrow and I might insult someone's mother. I don't want to do that. Um, um, just an outline of the talk. We're going to start with reconnaissance and looking at um, the exchange services and what's available to us as attackers and defenders. What kind of footprint do we expose to the internet when using exchange? Uh, but uh, the real meat of the talk is in exploitation. How can we take access to an exchange mailbox and turn that into remote code execution and gain a shell? So we've all been on one of those really boring assessments where we get given a limited scope, uh, a few IP addresses, and they normally include just VPN endpoints and possibly an OWA in instance. I want to show how you can take that kind of assessment and turn it into uh, remote access and finally pivot and get domain, domain admin. Then I also want to talk on some of the defensive um, aspects. So I'm going to be demonstrating two techniques and, and talking about three. And I want to also highlight some of the defenses that can be employed for these and also how Microsoft has reacted to this work. So Microsoft Exchange is something we've all encountered. Um, and the reason for this is it's become this ubiquitous computing uh, platform that Microsoft has pushed out to organizations to allow them to, to give mail access to their users. But it's morphed into something much more. It now allows you to do calendaring, uh, manage your, your tasks, your, your emails. You can sync to your device, your mobile device. You can sync to an Outlook instance. Uh, you can access it through OWA, et cetera. Uh, and as we've seen, Exchange is also a prime target for attackers. I really hope I don't offend any Deloitte employees. I'm really sorry this happened to you guys. Um, But we've seen this week that when attackers target exchange, they can do a lot of damage. And I don't know enough details from this attack, but it seems like the attackers only access mailboxes and read emails and, and got sensitive data. But from what I understand is if they'd known about Ruler, they probably could have done a lot more damage. They could have gone as far as backdooring every single user on the exchange. And having access for the foreseeable future. Now, because Exchange has become this uh, uh, computing device, uh, computing appliance that we can't live without, Microsoft has made it really easy for organizations to deploy it in a manner that it becomes accessible to all employees. Now, we all like to work remote. Uh, I see everyone here tends to work remote. And for that reason, Exchange is typically deployed on your network gateway. This allows both external and internal users to gain access to the Exchange services. Your Exchange server um, communicates with your Active Directory, so you're using your standard uh, authentication that you've already got built into your network. And this also holds true for your hybrid and your cloud deployments of Exchange. So if you're moving into Office 365, you might still have your Active Directory on-premise and use ADFS for your users to authenticate, but your Exchange server is hosted 
in, in Office 365, but your users are still on the internal network. So even if that case applies, we can still compromise this Exchange server and gain access to the internal network. Now, because, this, because the Exchange server needs to be deployed externally and accessible ex externally, we can use it as a really good reconnaissance point and a way to identify an attack surface for, for our future attacks. And to do this, we can reuse the mechanism Microsoft has built into Outlook to facilitate Outlook uh, connecting to Exchange. So normally when you set up an Outlook account, you receive a little pop-up box that asks for you to enter your email address. Uh, it'll follow up and say, hey, I need a username and a password, or I just need a password. You enter those details, and automatically your Outlook instance is configured. And the way this occurs is through this auto-discover service. What Outlook does is it grabs your domain from the email, and it'll try to connect to domain uh, slash autodiscover slash autodiscover.xml. And if it's able to connect to that endpoint, it'll try and do an authentication using either basic auth or NTLM auth, and it'll retrieve an XML uh, document that specifies all the information about that user's mailbox, uh, where the Exchange servers are located, and how to connect to them. If that fails, it falls over to a second discovery point. And this is just simply autodiscover.domain, autodiscover.xml. And if that fails, it tries it over HTTP. Now, these are the three main mechanisms for configuring Outlook from a remote um, instance. There are some ways to configure Outlook on an internal network that doesn't end up exposing your, your Exchange server to the internet, but that's not useful for most organizations. Now that we know how easy it is to, ident to do an auto-discover and identify um, an exchange server, just we wanted to know how much of the internet or how many companies actually make use of exchange. And our rough guesstimate is 10%. So this, this is not accurate. And the reason for this is it is based on the top million domains where we've stripped out all the subdomains and uniqued it, so we ended up with 260,000 uh, odd domains. And for each one of those domains, we did a DNS lookup for the auto-discover subdomain. If the subdomain existed, we would try and connect to, to the uh, auto-discover service on both HTTP and HTTPS. And if we received a 401 or a 403 response indicating that authentication was required, we could assume that this was an, an exchange instance. And also, we looked at two or three um, headers returned by the server, one being the FE uh, server header, and that, that just specifies the Exchange version that's running and a dead giveaway of Exchange. And the ASP.NET powered by, if it is powered by um, ASP.NET, you know that it's likely IAS and Exchange. And we ended up with 26,000 odd domains. Another interesting edge case is when you start deploying into Office 365, Microsoft gives you a special subdomain on this mail on Microsoft.com domain, and this makes it really easy for passive reconnaissance. You can simply query a database uh, such as Census and ret retrieve all the SSL certificates that have been issued for any subdomains of mail on Microsoft.com. And you can retrieve about four or 500 odd records through census, and then also virus total gives you this ability. It's just really nice from an attacker point of view, because you can um, footprint an organization passively without actually revealing that you are doing that reconnaissance. Now, once you've actually identified the endpoints, you want to gain access to those. You want to start logging into mailboxes and, and taking your attack further. And for access into an Exchange mailbox, you typically need three pieces of information, actually four. So typically when you configure through Outlook, you'll be asked for a username and a domain and the password, as well as the email address. What I found while implementing this tool ruler is that if I leave out the domain in my implementation of NTLM, the Exchange server will automatically do the authentication against the domain controller it is authenticating to. And in 90 to 100% of cases, this means that you're actually authenticating against the correct domain, so you don't need to know that information about a user. It's also really easy, easy from an uh, attacker perspective to find the username 
because usernames are usually similar to the email addresses. So if your company is using uh, dsmith as at company.com, then it's likely that dsmith is that person's username as well. And we all know how easy passwords are to guess, and that comes to our next part of the attack phase. So we need to get credentials for valid users. Easiest way to do this is typically a brute force attack, and the auto-discover endpoint provides an awesome area for us to do this uh, brute force attack because it's simply an NTLM authentication or a basic authentication request. You can do it with a GET, and it's really quick and easy to do. Um, so most organizations, if you do this, you'll tend to get in with your standard passwords of summer 2017, um, what's it, uh, September 2017, etc. cetera. Uh, another really easy one to do is phishing, and uh, phishing works really well because users like to give you their credentials. You simply ask for it. And the nice thing is you know that they're using these OA endpoints, so you can clone their OA mailbox uh, login screen or Office 365 login and send a very convincing phishing mail, and users will respond to it, and you know that it's a valid um, domain that they're used to seeing. But the best one that we found is using dumps. And when I refer to dumps, I mean something like the, the LinkedIn uh, breach database or uh, Adobe, etc. So every time a dump comes out, we tend to look in it for companies that we assess and for users that are exposed in that database. So I did the same for, our, um, for those 26,000 domains that I found had auto-discover exposed. I wanted to see how many of those had at least one employee in the LinkedIn breach. And it turns out 18,287 of those 26,000 companies had at least one of their employees using their work account and registering it on LinkedIn. Now, the LinkedIn breach is from 2012, but it's surprising me often that the credentials from 2012 are still valid for corporate accounts. Just last week, one of our analysts got into an account, a company using the LinkedIn breach database. They, they managed to compromise about three or four accounts for, and using the credentials from 2012. So now that we've been able to do our, our reconnaissance, we've gained access, we want to turn this into exploitation. So I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I don't want to talk about reading people's email. That's just creepy and that's something I do at midnight. We actually want to get shells. We want to get access to people's accounts. And back in November 2015, Nick Landers from Silent Break Security put out a blog post. It didn't get much attention for some reason, but he showed that using Outlook rules, you can actually get a shell. So the way this works is Outlook allows you to configure different client-side rules, and one of those client-side rules states execute this application when I receive an email that meets a certain criteria. What Nick found that by default, uh, those uh, applications are only allowed to exist on the local host, but he was able to hex edit the rule file, change the location of the application to a UNC path, and now all of a sudden you can get Outlook to fetch a remote shell and execute it on your behalf. Now this attack was great. And it was actually the inspiration for creating Ruler. Um, I don't want to go in depth into the rules because I want to get to the more exciting stuff. So if you are interested in how the rules attack looks or works, uh, I did a talk earlier in the year at Troopers, if you want to grab that. Now, the, the reason Nick's attack worked is this idea of synchronization. So Out Outlook and Exchange do a best effort to ensure that whatever you see on your Outlook instance is always in sync with the Exchange server and any other Outlook clients you have running. So if you want your work work workstation to have the same Outlook interface and same Outlook mails as your travel laptop, that happens automatically for you. And the original attack outlined by Nick required you to synchronize uh, your victim's mailbox to a, a local Outlook instance you have running. And this was really time consuming, I found, especially when a user had a large mailbox. It required you to have a dedicated VM just to run Outlook in. And I decided to write Ruler so that we can do this attack really quickly. Um, I've got it down to under two minutes to get a shell. And um, to do this, I had to look at how the synchronization process works. 
The synchronization occurs thanks to MAPI, or the Message Application Programming Interface. This is a, uh, it's not a protocol, but it's a way for Outlook and Exchange to reference data and perform actions on that data. And the way it works are through these ROP buffers, or remote operation buffers. You need to typically chain multiple ROP buffers together in order to uh, perform an action. So for example, if we wanted to create a new message, we first need to open the folder that we want to create that message in. So your sent items or your, your drafts folder. Then you create the message. Then you can have a whole bunch of ROPs that set different properties on that message. And then you want to save that message. If we look inside each ROP buffer, you'll see there's a ROP ID, which just indicates which action to perform, a login ID, which session to perform this in, your input and your output handle indexes. These are really interesting as they refer to tables that are created on the server side. So you create a table, you get a handle index to it, so you can think of uh, a pointer, and you need to keep passing that pointer into each subsequent drop buffer. So your output handle index from the open folder request turns into the input handle index for the create message, um, et cetera. Now because MAPI isn't a protocol, it needs to be communicated with the Exchange server in some way. And initially, this was just done simply RPC over TCP, your internal network. But as Microsoft made Exchange available externally and people started traveling, uh, organizations wanted a way to access Exchange without requiring a VPN. So Microsoft released Outlook Anywhere. And Outlook Anywhere uses RPC over HTTP. So it's that same RPC over TCP protocol has simply been wrapped in HTTP. And the way that works is Outlook issues an RPC data in HTTP request, and it, it does a keep alive on that request. So it doesn't actually receive any response from the server. It just keeps it open as a channel to keep sending HTTP data to the server. It sends a second request, an RPC data out request, which creates a, a channel to read on. And this, it will simply read responses from the server and never send data on this channel. And the Exchange server takes care of synchronizing these two channels. And th th this was a real pain to actually implement uh, because you have to try and get the synchronization right, I have to write my own um, HTTP parses, etc. Now if you look at those RPC HTTP requests, you've got your HTTP message, and inside that you've got this DCE RPC request. And this is just inside the HTTP body. And you might notice the NTLM SSP there, and that's because your, your actual RPC requests use the same RPC protocol that you see in your normal Microsoft network, and you need to do NTLM authentication on those actual requests. And the thing that happens here is you've actually got double authentication. So um, you've got NTLM authentication on the HTTP request, and that's typically also HTTPS. Then you've got NTLM authentication within that request, so on your RPC level, and you've got this, and that becomes encrypted and, and signed. So from a defender's point of view, it's really difficult or nearly impossible to actually inspect the traffic that is being sent over this channel, seeing as you've got HTTPS, sure, you can um, intercept that, but then you've got this encrypted blob on the inside, and you've got no way of, of seeing the data. And just keep that in mind. Um, then, because RPC over HTTP was a really complex and resource-intensive protocol, Microsoft decided to release MAPI over HTTP. And this is simply a, a two-way communication over single HTTP packets. You put your, your MAPI request or those ROP uh, buffers straight into the HTTP body, and you receive a response on the same HTTP request. Nice, lightweight, not resource-intensive. And this is the default going forward from Exchange 2016 and Office 365. Now, I just mentioned that you've got this really nice encrypted channel. And actually, in the talk I did at Troopers, I also showed how this can be turned into a C2 channel. So if you guys are looking for a really stealthy um, C2 channel, please check out the talk or the tool. And th what this does is it allows you to communicate with hosts on the internal network, especially in cases where you've got very restrictive outbound filtering, because the Exchange server or is always allowed to talk out, and this, this protocol needs to communicate out. You've got a, a guaranteed channel that will work 
even in the most restricted environment. Okay. So the work done by Nick was, was really great, and I, I was glad that I could discover the work and, and play around with it and create Ruler. The only problem was that it was someone else's work. He'd found the original attack. I wanted my own special attack. So I ended up digging into Outlook and seeing what's available. I came across something known as Outlook Forms. Now what Outlook Forms are, they are basically the core um, GUI component of any Outlook instance. And the way this works is that any message that you receive in Outlook has an associated form. So when you're sending an email, what's happening in the background, it actually gets assigned a message class, and typically that's ipm.note, and Outlook knows that when it receives a message of that class, that it should render it using a specific form, or built-in form for this. Now, you might see that when you, you send an appointment request to someone, that you still have the same kind of GUI interface as you have with a normal email, except now you receive, you have a, a little bar that you can actually say, yes, I accept this appointment, or no, I don't accept it, and you can add it to your calendar, et cetera. And that's where forms are, are kicking in. That's a custom form that has that appointment bar just built into it. Now, what Microsoft also wanted was for organizations to be able to create their own forms. So for whatever reason, an organization might want to have a custom message class that it is able to deploy to its employees and they can use to send um, messages and the GUI will change depending on those messages. What it actually how it actually gets, gets done is, from an Outlook perspective, you've got this developer bar and you can create your own form. And you can, yeah, you can see, you just modify what you, you see on the screen. Um, if anyone remembers forms from like, way back in the day, same kind of interface, same principle. But there's this really interesting component, and I don't know if anyone spotted it. So view code and run this form. Now, if you actually click on view code, you receive a little notepad pop-up. And, and it's very blank. It doesn't, it doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't give you any information. It's not like the, the VBA um, editor that you've got built into to Office typically, where you've got this nice IDE um, where you can actually interact with, with your VBA code. But because this is separated from that v, VBA engine, it means you've also got a VB script engine that's completely isolated from your normal security rules. The VBA engine has to comply with your standard office rules. So if you and an organization have say, said that users can only run signed macros or all macros are disabled, VBA macros in Outlook will also won't work. But this VB script will still work because it's not VBA, right? So from, a, from an attacker perspective, what you could do at this point was you can create you can clone someone's mailbox, you create a custom form, and you can run it. But the only problem is it's running on your Outlook instance. What I needed to find was a way to synchronize this with Exchange and have it distributed to, to, to the users and to our targets. So fortunately for me, I'd written Ruler, and I had this nice mappy library that I could actually go about and create creating this attack. So I dug into it. And I figured that if I create an ipm.note and you give it your, your suffix, so this is what, what it should trigger on, and you attach your VB script, all you need to do is you need to publish it to that user's inbox. And in the GUI, if you go back to the GUI, you can see you've got this, this publish option and you can do it easily. But what actually happens when you're clicking publish is that this form gets written as a message to a hidden folder or a hidden table within your Outlook folder. This hidden table is called your associate table. This contains all the metadata and other information associated with that folder. And um, in this case, we can define our custom message class. We attach our VB script into that, that uh, message. And Outlook goes, hey, I need to synchronize this and sends it to Exchange. Outlook receives it goes, hey, I need to synchronize this with everyone else and it will send it out to, to all your Outlook instances. So it went about and, and turned this into a nice attack, so Ruler can actually do this for you now. You can just say, hey, I want this VB script to be associated to this specific form. Can you please create it for me and um, 
trigger it. So. Okay. so the very first thing you normally want to do when you gain access to a set of credentials is you want to just verify that those credentials, one, that they work, and also what you need to know is that the user is actually active in Outlook. So if Outlook isn't running, you can't get a shell through Outlook. So what I've built into Ruler is this check option, and it'll check if the credentials work, but it'll also see where the last message was sent from and at what time it was sent. So it'll tell you, hey, this user's sending it from OWA, so it's probably not, not a good idea to target them. Now the user gets working in Outlook, and they decide to send an email. They send the email, and what will happen is that this message will now get, get saved to their send folder, and Ruler can actually interrogate that message, find out when it was sent, and where it was sent from. So if we go back to Ruler, we run the exact same, same command again, you'll see that the output changes slightly. We'll be told that this was sent from MSRPC, which means Outlook. And you can also see it, it gives away the, the IP address where the user is coming from, so you can also verify that the user is in scope and maybe they're working from home or they, they're working from the office. Now what I've done for this attack is I've set up a Metasploit handler out on the internet, um, just a standard reverse TCP for this demo. I've got some VB script, uh, shell uh, VB script here that simply downloads some, some shell code over here. It'll download that shell code for me, run it in memory. Uh, this is based off of um, uh, James Forshaw's work, and uh, yeah, so it all executes in memory. You can see down is uh, the shell code for us. We've got our listener serving the shell code, and now we want to create our malicious form. That's really, really simple. Uh, this is all documented in the ruler wiki as well on the, on the um, GitHub re repo. So we, we create a suffix, so that's at ipm.note.echo13. Uh, we give it the input, that's our, our VB script that is going to attach to this form. We're going to say send, which means send a trigger email to actually trigger this form for us. But we've also instructed Ruler to create a rule. What happens with this rule creation, it, it creates an auto-delete rule for any messages of the, the message class ipm.note.echo13, and as soon as that message arrives in the inbox, Outlook will delete the message. And during that delete phase, it triggers the form and tells Outlook to run the VB script. So our VB script gets run automatically, email disappears, it doesn't even show up in the deleted items. This is a permanent delete. So the user's got no um, forensic evidence that the message was ever in their inbox. So it all creates a trigger rule, it sends an email, and this all happens really quickly, actually. The synchronizations happen in the background. The email's been created, and I didn't even have time to switch over to, to show you where the email comes into the inbox or anything like that, because it already triggered and it's created our reverse shell for us. And we, we get a nice typical shell, can interact with that as we would with, with normal uh, Metasploit. Um, I typically tend to use either Cobalt Strike or Empire for this as well. They work really well. Um, and the, the C2 channel I mentioned earlier for Lineal, it uses Empire, so you've got this Empire um, C2 channel. Oh. Oh. Got our shell. <laughs> now, what do we want to do as a, as a good attacker is we want to clean up after ourselves. So um, I, I forgot to do this at the beginning. I never used to clean up my rules. So I've still got one client that keeps pinging back to me asking if it can delete, download a shell and execute it. And I've, I've told the client multiple times, hey, you've got a compromised user, and they just don't fix it. So what Ruler will do, it will log in, it will delete the form, it will delete any rules associated with it, and it, it's as if you were never there. Now, just for Echo Party, I also created a few additional features that I wanted to introduce into Ruler. Um, I've created the ability to download the global address book. So maybe you've compromised an account and you realize that user isn't active in Outlook. 
that you want to get other possible targets. So you can actually just download the whole, uh, oh, sorry, search first. So you can search a user's email. Um, this will do a, a server-side search. The very nice thing about this is it creates a search folder on the server. The server does a search for you, and it will return results when they're available. So from an attacker perspective, you're not downloading the whole mailbox and then doing a search. You're just saying, hey, only give me the messages that match my search term. So it's nice and lightweight and really fast. Um, and you can also limit the search to only search the, the subject line, et cetera. And you can see we, we get all, all the searched emails. Now, the, the final component is that, that global address book downloader that I mentioned. And what you can do by default in Ruler is simply dump the global address book. This will dump the first 100 or first 1,000 users to your terminal, and you can see what their, their, their first name, surname, and email address is. There's also um, a save to file option, which allows you to download the entire global address book. So for, for most of our clients that we've compromised, I've done this, and now I've got, I've got about uh, 120,000 valid email addresses. So should another assessment ever come up, I can just go, hey, let's, let's take all these email addresses and try brute force them again. So Ruler was really successful at this point, and we've got two ways to get a shell. We've got, we've got rules and we've got forms. But what I was thinking to myself is, like, well, if there's two ways to get code execution in Outlook, surely there's a third, you know? Trouble happens in threes. So I started digging into Outlook again, and the best way to do this is to look at legacy components. So I found this really great book, it's uh, Programming for Outlook 2007. And it mentioned the Outlook homepage. I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. What is the Outlook homepage? Well, it turns out it's simply a URL that you can specify to be the homepage for a specific folder. So if I as an organization or as a user don't want to see the default inbox when I open my Outlook fo inbox folder, I want Outlook to, I don't know, give me, the, give me my fortune or just say hello to me every time I open it, we can set a remote home page, and it's simply it's an HTML page. Outlook will fetch the page, download it, and render it in a, an IE frame for you. So easy enough. Start thinking, okay, IE frame, how is Outlook able to present HTML content to you, but also still display your inbox to you. What it turns out is you can embed ActiveX controls into this IE frame, and in this case, we're embedding the, the view controller for that folder. So what, what will happen is the HTML will render, the view controller will trigger, and it will go, okay, I'm in the inbox, I should display all the, the messages in the inbox. But because we've got ActiveX, it means we can also interact with it through VBScript or JScript. So I thought, oh, great, this is going to be really easy. Let's just have an on-window load. We create an object. We'll reference wscript.shell, and we'll run our command. Easy peasy, right? Turns out, no, it's not that easy. Because ActiveX has got such a horrible security history, Microsoft's worked really hard on sandboxing ActiveX and preventing what you can actually do through ActiveX. And this IE frame that gets loaded is, um, falls into your standard internet security zones, and you can't just in instantiate any ActiveX control. So if you want to instantiate anything like WScript or file system object, et cetera, you get this access denied kind of pop-up, and Microsoft tells you to go away. But not wanting to give up, decided to dig into it a bit further. Found one way to, to get code execution, but you know, it, it wasn't great. Like, you, you had to write a file to the file system, and then you have to get the users to trigger it or reboot their machine, and it wasn't that reliable. I wanted a really nice sand, sandbox escape kind of attack. So I've, I found a, a zero day. I've reported it to Microsoft. They've told me they're going to be patching it in, in October. So you guys are the first people to see it outside of SensePost and, and Microsoft. Um, I'd appreciate, well, you guys can probably use it, but I'd appreciate not sharing it too widely. So, as I mentioned, uh, that view controller or that, that IE frame that you get is actually in the sandbox. And that sandbox specifies what 
um, ActiveX controls you can access. But one ActiveX control, what you can do is you can access the ActiveX controls that have been instantiated, in this case, the view controller. And you can ask that view controller object to give you information about itself. You can say, hey, view controller, what methods and functions do you have? What objects do you know about? So if you grab the view controller and you go through all its known, known functions and, and handles, you'll find this one called Outlook Application. And all that Outlook application is, it's a handle to the parent Outlook application. I mean, simply, what happens at this point is, as soon as you grab that handle, you escape the sandbox. Uh, this was not a, a complex memory corruption attack. It was, hey, I just get a handle to an object outside of the sandbox. So we, we get an Outlook, a handle to Outlook, and we say, hey, Outlook, tell me what objects or methods you've got. It turns out Outlook has this wrapper method called create object which simply wraps around VBScript and allows you to instantiate objects. Now, if you call application.createObject, you're, no, you're no longer executing in the context of, of the IE frame. You're executing in the context of Outlook itself. So you can actually instantiate all these objects you weren't allowed to instantiate before, and now you can get a shell. I'm just going to show you guys that I'm not cheating. I'm not reusing forms or rules in this case. I'm going to be using um, the, the, out, the home page attack. We just log into the account, verify there are no rules, log in, verify there are no forms. And then we want to create our actual home page. So on that home page, I've just reused um, the the pieces of code I've, I've put up on the slides. So I've just got an HTML body that creates, an out, um, creates a view controller object, then some VB script that creates a handle, get, gets, instantiates W script, and then executes uh, the standard Empire PowerShell one-liner. So, so Outlook instance running. Now we're going to create our home page, and we'll just Use ruler again as before, and instead of saying forms or, or rules, we'll just say home page, and we'll just give it the URL where our shell, or our, our shell code exists. What ruler will do, it'll add this URL to the user's mailbox, and our Exchange will automatically synchronize it for us. So again, it's a very simple attack, um, and in this case, requires very little effort from us. That's it, done. Now, the only slight downside with this is that that form needs, that home page needs to be triggered. And Outlook's not constantly going, hey, I need to refresh the, the view, because, well, it's got the view open, so it's not going to refresh it if it's open already. So sometimes, in this case, to speed up the demo, I've closed Outlook, and I, I'm going to leave the inbox and go back to the inbox. I'm going to go, somebody go into the drafts, go back to my inbox, and now Outlook goes, hey, I've got a form, I've got a home page that needs to be loaded. Goes and downloads the home page for you, and immediately you end up getting a shell. So again, this is not that easy to, uh, it's not a, the same as forms or rules where you can trigger it through an email. But the nice thing about that is you've got a way of persisting on the box. You've, you've simply got a URL that's going to be called from time to time um, every time the user accesses their inbox, uh, so they're going to browse away, go to their sent items, to go back to the inbox. From a user perspective, let's go back. You've actually got no indication that you've you've been shelled, right? So you can see uh, only slight indication you might have is that you've got two 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 bars now. You've got an internal one and an external one. So that internal one's from the view controller, and that's the actual. But most users aren't going to pick up on that. It's very stealthy. And you see, it's just going to constantly pop a shell for you. So you need to actually build some logic into your shells to not um, constantly pop a shell. And the reason why it constantly pops a shell is that Outlook also caches that home page for you. It's trying to be helpful. It goes, OK, well, maybe you're on a slow network connection. I know it's going to 
be bandwidth intensive to always fetch this HTML page, why don't I just save it for you in Outlook and we'll use that for the foreseeable future. So now even if I go and delete this, this URL, I'm still gonna be able to, to get a shell for a, a short while until Outlook maybe closes or that cache, cache expires. So we've reset our view and the user can still interact with it and we'll still get a shell. So that, that, that brings me to the slight downside of, of this attack is it is very persistent about being persistent. It's gonna end up doing this to you. So if you don't build some logic into your actual exploit, you're gonna be constantly getting shells. So you might end up having like 50 shells on that user's account if they're very click, clicky happy. So remember to build some logic in to say, hey, don't, don't create a new shell if you already have one. Now, it, it's great from an attacker perspective, but what we also have to do in our day job is provide clients with a way of defending against us and defending against, against attackers. So I took some time to look into Ruler and see how we can actually defend against it. <clears throat> and the, the one great thing about Ruler is that it's created a response from Microsoft. So just this morning I was chatting to, to one of the guys at Microsoft and he was saying, well, Ruler is great, thanks. It's, it's changed the way that we look at these kind of bugs and, and we, we're gonna be treating them differently going forward. And they, they started doing that with rules and back in December 2016, they released this patch that actually prevents uh, application, so, uh, the application type rules in Outlook 2003 and 2006. Um, the only downside is it's done through this H key current user um, enable cl unsafe client side mail rules. So as an attacker, if you have compromised the box and you want a, a way to have persistence, you can easily change this registry key to allow rules and the attack will still work for you in the future. Now forms, forms says, I thought Microsoft were ignoring it, they're not gonna do anything about it. And then patch Tuesday this September, they managed to give me a heart attack because I thought none of my demos were gonna work for Echo Party. Uh, because they've re released this, this patch, which completely disables all forms going back to Outlook, I think 2010 or 2007. So you can no longer have custom forms that have VBScript associated with them in Outlook. You, needed, you need to go through multiple steps to enable it. There's one registry key you first need to enable to allow forms with VBScript. Then you need to start creating registry keys for every single form that has VBScript associated with them and say, hey, this specific form is allowed to execute VBScript. So it's a very comprehensive defensive mechanism from Microsoft. Only problem is users need to be patching and a lot of organizations tend to ignore office specific patches. They focus on, on Windows and their servers. They ignore the, the endpoints. So for the foreseeable future, we've still got a nice attack surface. And then we've also got the, the homepage now going forward. Um, from a defensive perspective, if we want to start blocking this attack on the gateway, well, for the rules, it's really easy. You just monitor for any web dev, dev traffic and you can, you can block it. Uh, for, but the best, best actual defense for this is using MFA or 2FA. And Microsoft, again, have been really uh, positive here and they've released uh, MFA for Exchange 2016, Office 365, and just this week they announced that this week or last week, they announced that they're allowing third-party integrators like DO to um, enable 2FA on the advanced exchange services and Azure. Um, from a dis detection per perspective, I've built a few canaries into Ruler. So Ruler actually sets its user agent as Ruler. So if you're monitoring your exchange web server logs, you can detect that. Or the workstation used with the NTLM authentication is also set to ruler. So if you, on your domain controller or your exchange server, view your event logs and look through authentication attempts, if you find ruler, this is being used against your organization. But that wasn't good enough for me. This was all kind of client side de detection or there was no way to, to do this efficiently across an organization. So again, the, the Deloitte example, if they suspected any users had been compromised by ruler, they would need to go to each individual workstation check for signs of compromise, and try and identify ruler. Unfortunately, the, the PowerShell toolkit available to exchange administrators offer no way to either read client-side rules that are stored in a, a user's mailbox, read forms, 
or interrogate any information about the home page. So I've created this tool, not ruler, which is essentially a wrapper around ruler, and it simply does the display functionality from ruler. And what it allows an exchange administrator to do is use his credentials and provide a list of mailboxes that he wants to interrogate. It will log into each mailbox because Exchange admins can impersonate users, and it will pull out the rules, it will pull out the forms, it will pull out the home pages and tell you if anything exists. So if you run this for rules, it will go, hey, this, this user has client-side rules, and this is the, the application that executes. Maybe you want to check it out. For forms, it will do the same thing. It will identify the form for you. It will pull out the VB script, and you can verify if a user has been compromised or not. And the same with home pages. It will just give you the endpoint so you can very quickly um, blacklist or block that endpoint on your, your gateway. So um, I've, I'm releasing the updates to Ruler uh, today, later today. Um, not Ruler, I'm also making it public straight after this talk. So if you guys want to use that going forward or recommend it to clients, please do. And any pull request or uh, any info, anything you want to contribute is most welcome. There's a comprehensive wiki associated with Ruler if you want to um, play around with it. Most questions people have ever asked me are available in the wiki, um, but also in the issues, please create an issue or just email me directly. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, I think I'm out of time. I'm going to be next door doing a workshop now, so if you've got questions, I'm going to be in the workshop uh, going over Ruler, so if you've got anything specific, I can demonstrate it, etc. Gracias. We have time for one. Yeah. Okay. Lights, please. Luces, equipo. <laughs> Someone? Okay. Hands up. Nobody? Well, thank nope. you. Oh,